Hi, welcome back to The Wandering Wesleyan. I'm Chaplain Greg, and we're continuing in our Walking in the Word series. And uh, we were introduced to David last week. And uh, David has been chosen to succeed Saul as king. God has seen David's heart. David is a, at this point, he's just a kid, but he loves God. And he defeats Goliath because he has complete and utter trust in the Lord. And that's what matters to God. God doesn't really care how we look. He doesn't care, you know, if we are the smartest person in the room or, or whatever. He cares that we love him and we trust him because he's always going to have the best for us. So where do we go from here? David has been anointed king, but he's not king yet. Saul is still king. And David respects Saul as king up until the end of his life. David and Saul's son, Jonathan, develop a very close, close brotherhood kind of relationship that, uh, that is disturbing to Jonathan's father, Saul. Um, Saul is jealous of David, and he spends the rest of his life chasing David down. Saul is demonized. He is afflicted by evil spirits. In chapter 22, verses 11 through 23, Saul kills all the priests because the priests, the Levites, realize that Saul is not acting in a godly manner. Saul is leading Israel astray. David resorts at some point to hide in Philistine territory. And Saul eventually resorts to divination and consults with Samuel's dead spirit. And this is in chapter 28 of 1 Samuel. Saul and his son, David's best friend Jonathan, are killed in chapter 31. And 1 Samuel ends with Saul dying on a hill and I'm going to show you a picture of that hill and uh, this is where Saul and Jonathan were killed by the Philistines and this brings us into the second half of the Samuel scroll second Samuel because now it's time for David Saul is gone and David's been anointed king uh, Samuel has passed away and so David is surrounding himself with godly men and he's going to become king. David writes a very long lament poem and when we get to the Psalms we'll talk about lament poems um, about Saul and that's from ch chapter 2 verses 19 through 27. It's a beautiful uh, pouring out of his heart for his king, because he still respects Saul. God anointed Saul to, to be king, even though Saul failed miserably and lost that anointing, David still respected him throughout. David is made king over Judah, and Saul's son Ishbosheth is king over Israel. Now, this is not the last time we're going to see a division between Judah, which is the southern kingdom, and Israel, which is all the northern tribe kingdoms. Civil war erupts. David wins. Chapter 5 in 2 Samuel, David is made king over all of Israel. David, in chapter uh, 14, so we're jumping ahead a little bit here. In chapter 14, he conquers these people called the Jabus. And the Jabus live in a city called Salem. You remember Salem from Genesis with Melchizedek, who was king and priest over Salem. And this city is called Jebus Salam, or Jerusalem, and quickly becomes the center for all of Israel, Jerusalem. Going back a ways, chapter six, uh, David tries to move the ark and the tabernacle into Jerusalem. But he, do, uh, but he does not follow the method that God instructed him to. 
they put them on it, put it on a cart. And as they're going forth, it almost falls off and somebody puts their hand on it and that person dies. Why? It seems harsh. It is harsh. Because God said, do it this way. And they weren't doing it in the way he instructed. Obedience is better than sacrifice. This is a theme that comes up frequently. Eventually, they do get it to Jerusalem, and David celebrates as the ark is moved into the city and the tabernacle is set up there. Chapter 7, David asks God a very important question. He wants to build a temple, a permanent home for the ark and for God. Remember, it's the presence of God that's in the ark in the Holy of Holies portion of the tabernacle. This is the presence of God, and, and David is asking, please let me build you a house. But God says, no, that's for your son. Your son will build my house. Now, until this point, we've been talking very highly of David. In David's career, see, Saul started off high and went down. David started off low, went up, and Really, in chapter 7, this is the peak of his career as king. But something happens, and he has a moral failing. He never quits loving God, but he has a severe moral failing. And this moral failing leads to his decline. And we don't think of David being a king in decline. We, we think of David as a man after God's own heart, a man who, who loved and served God. And that is certainly true. But after this sin, his, his reign as king is never the same. And it sets up for further generations having issues. So chapter 11, we get to the story of Bathsheba. Now, we don't really know her real name. You say, well, her name's Bathsheba. Well, Bathsheba means daughter of Sheba. And it could be a region. There was a place called Sheba. She could be a woman from Sheba. She could be the daughter of some dude named Sheba. Okay? Or her name actually could have been Bathsheba, but we're not quite sure. Chapter 11, David is home from the battle, he sh this is his first moral failing because he should be with his troops out in the field. It's the season to go out and fight the Philistines. But no, he's staying back. And when he stays back from the battle, and this is not a good place for a king to be, he sees Bathsheba on a roof bathing. Now, This is tricky because when you look at how the houses were arranged and how things happened back then. So the houses were arranged in that David's closest generals were situated around his house. So Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, certainly would have been right there. So everybody would know that the king was still in the castle, including Bathsheba. It says that she was bathing. Now that means a mikvah. Mikvahs are done inside behind closed doors. She was up on the roof at a place where she would know David would see her. The language indicates that possibly after David saw her and went to her, the language indicates she could have been raped. Very well could have been. But she's not without some culpability in this either. I know we're never supposed to blame the victim, and that is certainly true. But she set up the entire episode. She set him up 
because she knew that she would be seen on the roof. She becomes pregnant from this episode. Uriah, who is a foreigner, he's not a natural born Israeli. He is a foreigner. He probably knew what happened when he got home. And he would not allow David to get away with it. Eventually, David has him killed. Chapter 12 is the pivotal chapter. In chapter 12, David is confronted by Nathan the prophet and his sin is revealed. And as a result of this sin, David's life is forever changed. The baby who is born from Bathsheba dies. And for the rest of his rule, David is constantly at war, not only with his enemies surrounding him, but also with his family. For example, his son, Amnon, rapes his, sis rapes his sister, David's daughter, Tamar. His son, Absalom, rebels against him, against David, after he kills Amnon. You know, just all kinds of family turmoil is happening. Absalom leaves this rebellion in chapters 18 and 19. David actually flees Jerusalem because of it. Absalom is eventually killed. David is distraught, but he's restored as king. Chapter 21 and 22, there's another rebellion. Uh, fellow by the name of Sheba, mm -hmm. where we heard that, from the tribe of Benjamin, revolts. David puts it down. Uh, chapter 22 and Psalm 18 are the same. It's, a, it's another psalm about this whole episode. And when we get to the psalms, we're going to see how many of them by David are reflecting different episodes in his life. Uh, chapter 23 is David's last song. And chapter 24 is David's final sin. Uh, David takes a census of Israel when he wasn't asked to do that. Remember, when we go back to the book of Numbers, and even Joshua, that there's censuses taken because God orders it. Well, David does it on his own. He doesn't ask God. This was not something he asked God about. And God punishes David by forcing him to choose between three punishments. Seven years of famine, flee for three months from his enemies, or three days of plague. David really can't decide. So he puts it in the, in the Lord's hands, and a plague comes, and 70,000 people died because of David's sin. We think of David as a man after God's own heart, and he was. But that doesn't mean that he led a carefree, perfect life. He led a very messy life. He led a very morally compromised life towards the end. But the one thing that didn't change was that he always loved God. He didn't always put him first in his life. He did sin, and his sin had disastrous consequences. But he always loved God. So that's it for David. David eventually dies, and that's where 2 Samuel, the Samuel scroll ends. And um, that's where we're going to end for this week. A little bit shorter one for this week. But I want you to sit on that. Think about your life. Think about the things that uh, go on in your life. Do you beat yourself up? over the sins that you've committed? Do you constantly remind yourself of your moral failings? When we come to Jesus, and when David went to God, we receive forgiveness, and those sins are blotted out. There's still may, may be natural consequences for those sins, but they are blotted out. What matters to God, what mattered to God with David, what matters to God for you and me is that we always come back to him as our first love. 
So with that, if you enjoy these videos, I ask that you just please like and subscribe, share them, make some comments below if you would. And uh, until next week, God bless, and we'll see you then.